look at the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 2. This will be in the lectionary for next week. Oh, by the way, we will be starting our pastor's Bible study uh, next Saturday at 2 o'clock. So if you can be here, that would be great. And if you come up with an original idea, don't worry, I will steal it and use it on Sunday morning. So, I'm looking then at Hebrews chapter 2. The entire chapter is good. Hebrews was written by, who knows who it was written by. There was a while there, even in our lifetimes, when people attributed it to Paul, but the early church fathers knew that Paul had not written it, or thought that, that, that might, maybe Paul had not written it. But it is a very ancient letter. It was in existence in A.D. 70. I mean, think about that. In A.D. 70. That was that predated some of the Gospels. A.D. 70 is like you figured that uh, uh, Christ uh, died. They didn't get the numbers quite right. Probably was born about B.C. 6 or A.D. 6. So uh, that means that uh, about A.D. 42 is when he died, if that's the case. Uh, I mean, so this is like just, you know... 30 years, less than 30 years after the death of Christ, after the resurrection of Christ, more importantly, that this letter was written. So it tells us a lot about what the early Christians thought. This is written by a Hellenized Jew, that is, by a, a Greek Jew who had, who had converted to Christianity. Uh, not a um, someone out in the out in the empire, somebody who spoke Greek and written in Greek, but it has this references to all of the Hebrew scriptures and all of the Old Testament uh, up through the all the books of Moses are referred to in this letter. And although I know that we don't live by the law of Moses, most of us are not extremely familiar with it, or if we are, we have basically rejected it because it seems like so many details that we don't have to live with today. Nevertheless, it sort of gets to the spirit of God and of what God was trying to do or what God was beginning to do in the law. He's talking before this. He says, um, um, actually, 2 says, this is why, or therefore. So we better start a little before that. Um, he's, saying, uh, he's saying, but he says to his son, I'm looking, by the way, back at 1 verse uh, 8. But he says to his son, God, your throne is forever and your kingdom scepter is a rod of justice, your loved righteousness and hated lawless behavior. And that is why God, your God, has anointed you with oil instead of your companions. And he says, the Lord laid the earth's foundations in the beginning and the heavens are made by your hands. They will pass away, but you remain. They will all wear out like old clothes. You will fold them up like a coat. They will be changed like a person changes clothes. But you stay the same, and your years shall have no end. Your life will not come to an end. Where, when has he ever said of any of the angels, sit at my right side until I put your enemies under your feet like a footstool? Aren't all the angels ministering spirits who are sent to serve? And who are uh, those who are going to inherit salvation? Those who are going to inherit salvation. That's you. That's us. That's human beings. That's this is sort of a thing that's, that's talking about how lofty human beings are. And of course, we see in the book of Genesis that God made humans and said, "Rule over the world. Have dominion over the over the the, the plants and animals, over the land and the sea and the sky." And, and indeed, we are getting a lot of dominion. In some cases, we've sort of abused it or misused it. We've lost a lot of species, we've lost a lot of land, and, and we've sort of messed things up. Nevertheless, we do have dominion over these things, and perhaps when we are able to deal with them wisely, we will have dominion over all things. That is, by the way, what God would have. Uh, the, uh, verse uh, chapter 2. This is why it's necessary for us to pay more attention to what we've heard, or else we may drift away from it. If the message that was spoken by angels was reliable, and every offense and act of disobedience received an appropriate consequence, how will we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? It was first announced through the Lord, that is Jesus Christ, and then it was confirmed by those who heard Him, that is the apostles. God also vouched for their message with signs, amazing things, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, which were handed out the way He wanted. The very fact that Jesus was able to perform miracles, raising the dead and healing the lame and Restoring sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. This is God's testimony that He has a true, a, a true thing spoken. And then after that, at uh, the hands of John and Paul and Peter, we have just a few miracles. Nevertheless, we have enough to know that this is God's seal of approval on the message that they were giving. 
Verse 5, God didn't put the world that is coming, and that's the world we're talking about, under the angel's control. Instead, he declared, someone declared somewhere, what is humanity that you think about them? Or what is the human being that you care about them? For a while you made them lower than the angels, and you crowned the human beings with glory and honor, and put everything under their control. That happens to be from Psalm 8, verses 4 to 6. Um, when he puts everything under their control, he doesn't leave anything out of control. But right now, you don't yet see everything under their control. That would be us, and we don't control everything, do we? We don't control everything. However, we do see the one, that one being Jesus, the one who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while. It's Jesus. He's the one who is now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of his death. He suffered death so that he could taste death for everyone through God's grace. It was appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, to use experiences of suffering to make perfect the pioneer of salvation. This salvation belongs to many sons and daughters whom he's leading to glory. This is because the one who makes people holy, that would be Jesus, and the people who are being made holy, that would be us, all come from one source be God. That is why Jesus isn't ashamed to call them brothers and sisters when he says, I will publicly announce your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the middle of the assembly. He also says, I will rely on him and also here are the children whom you and God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in the flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also shared in the same things in the same way. He did this to destroy the one who holds the power over death, the devil, by dying. He set free those who were held in slavery their entire lives by their fear of death. Of course, he isn't trying to help angels, but rather he's helping Abraham's descendants. Therefore, he, has made, he was made like his brothers and sisters in every way. This was so that he could be merciful and faithful as a high priest in things relating to God in order to wipe away the sins of the people. He's able to help those who are being tempted, since he himself experienced suffering and was tempted. See, it's not enough to say that Jesus could to conquer death, or that he was able to conquer death, or that he was empowered to conquer death. We would never believe it, and we would never know it was true, except for the fact that Jesus actually did conquer death. And so we have this prophecy from olden times, from the, from the Psalms and from the Old Testament that said God is going to put everything under the feet of humanity, that God is going to make us rule over everything. And yet we know that we don't rule over everything. For instance, we don't rule over death. We all have to face that. Well, Jesus therefore voluntarily faced that, voluntarily faced death and rose from the dead. Jesus conquered death says he's not serving angels who don't die. Angels don't have that fear. They may have fear of punishment. They may have fear of separation. They don't have a fear of death. Human beings have that and mortals have that. Of course, he isn't trying to help angels, but rather he's helping Abraham's descendants. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way. Jesus was made like us. Jesus became a mortal like us. This was so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God in order to wipe away the sins of the people. See, if a high priest knows everything and a high priest sees God face to face and a high priest is all that holy, but the high priest doesn't speak our language, then that's not doing us much good. If the high priest is not visible to us or if he's visible in a form that we can't understand, then that's not any good. Jesus had to become like us. Not so that God could be satisfied that his son had suffered. That was not the point. But so that we could be satisfied that this is one that can understand what we're going through. This is one who can relate to us. This is one who has conquered death because his disciples literally saw him die. And then they literally saw him risen from the dead. So that's how they knew, and by that, to their testimony, that's how we know that indeed Jesus has conquered death. And if Jesus, the one made like us, can conquer death, then guess what? We will conquer death as well. You might as well say we've already done it. You might as well say we've already done it. He's able to help those who are tempted since he himself experienced suffering and was tempted. Um, 
Where is it? Um, oh, he set free in 15. This verse is worth remembering. He set free those who were held in slavery their entire lives by their fear of death. This, this very thing of mortality, of our growing weakness and our, our aging process and, and knowing that we are in some weird sense that we're going, that we're, we're marching toward destruction. Now it would be, this would be a sad life indeed if that's what we were all doing. And we're all doing it, by the way. I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not as fast as I used to be. I'm not as strong as I used to be. I don't remember things like I used to. The read people, somebody said, you have this weird obsession with your glasses. I don't have this weird obsession with I have to do this or I don't see the scripture. I have to do this or I don't see you. So I end up with little scratch marks on the side of my head where I keep putting these things on and off. Aging process. There's no getting around it. I can't really pretend that I'm a young man. I'm not all that young. I'm younger than some, but not as young as others. We're all aging. And we're all growing older. And the truth is, it's, you know, and Paul points out that it's not just us. It's not just a human thing. It's not just that humans sinned and therefore humans... Are, it's this imperfection that... That's a, that theoretically, human behavior brought into the world, has be become a part of the life cycle of everything. You know, the great oak trees out there, th those oak trees, there's, there's a couple of them that are 100 years old probably. They're, they're ancient. They're, they're, they're more than that. Uh, we had one, a limb fell off of it, and I found an old rusty spike of a nail inside this tree, where obviously when it was a sapling, somebody had nailed something onto this tree. Who knows? I wish I had the wanted poster that was nailed on that tree or whatever it was that was out there. That tree was preserved but alas, the limb fell off and now you look up there and they said, well, you, can, you don't have to cut this tree down, but you can if you want to because it's dying. That's why these trees are putting out so many acres because somehow the trees know that they are dying and that's why the limbs are falling off uh, the the. Uh, there's a big hole in that tree. You look up, you see this, uh, this, this shell fungus or this looks like a mushroom growing out of the tree. Nature itself. Paul said nature, the creation itself groans. Creation itself. And he says not only us, but creation itself groans for the coming. Groans for the redemption. Groans for the redemption. We look at these things and on the one hand we think, well, how can God be so cruel as to put us in this predicament? And yet we don't think of God as being cruel when, when leaves fall and rot and become, become compost and become uh, plants. We don't, we don't regret the fact that there has to be room and light for a young sapling tree to grow. We don't regret the fact that a, that a huge tall oak would start showing would start showing its, its gnarl and its stretch and its breakage and, and these kind of things. We don't think of this as cruel. We think, well, that's just the way things are. Well, the, the suffering that we go through, it's just the way things are. But it's not the way things were intended to be and it's not the way things are going to be. The way things are going to be is that God has put everything under Jesus' feet. Jesus died the same death that we're all so worried about and scared of. In fact, a worse death than that. Jesus died and was buried in the third day he rose from the dead. And now, guess what? Jesus is not going to die anymore. Jesus is not going to get any older. Jesus is not going to get any weaker. That's the way this is. And by the Spirit of God, by the testimony of history, by the testimony of those who have handed this down to us, we know that this is true. And what we know is that because it says that the one, the one through whom salvation comes, that is Jesus Christ, is of the same flesh and blood as the ones who are being saved, the ones who are being redeemed. That is us. God made Jesus for God's glory. God made us for God's glory. And God is not glorified. You know, it said, how will, you know, the psalmist said, well, how, can, how will we praise you in the grave? Well, we won't. We won't. We'll praise God in the flesh. Job said, I will say, Job said, I know my Redeemer lives, and I will see him with my own eyes. I will see God with my own eyes. Well, God appeared in human form. We may 
we, God may be, you know, when Moses, when God walked by Moses, God said, you can't even look at me. You'll, you know, you'll, even though God said, Moses and I are friends enough that we see each other face to face. The truth is, God said, you can't even look at me. But I'll cover up the cave, and when I walk by, you can glance out and see me passing. You can see my glory passing you because the, because the glory of God is just too much for us to face. Therefore, to be our high priest, to be our encouragement, to be our friend and our savior, God had to put on flesh. God had to put on mortality, put on the imperfection. Uh, and, and therefore, he did in the form of Jesus Christ. And we, the human race, saw that. Maybe you and I did not have the good fortune of seeing Jesus in the flesh, but our descendants did, and they put him made a record of it. And maybe you and I did not have the privilege of seeing Christ performing miracles, but I think we've all seen the Holy Spirit performing miracles. I think we have seen, you know, we have we have seen what as close as you can come to resurrections. Some of you may have actually seen a resurrection. But we have seen God allow our brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. He's, he's, we've seen God allow various people to come close to death and then be brought back. So that we could know. We, God has allowed us to see things that would be impossible without the power of God. Now, we wish we could see that every time. We wish that we could see that every time somebody every time somebody gets sick, we wish that they would get well. Every time somebody dies, we wish they'd come back to life. Every time somebody goes unconscious, we wish that they would wake up. And that's not happening. That's not happening. But the fact that that is not happening is a setup. Because there is such a fantastic glory to be revealed. It's one thing to see somebody raised up, to see somebody healed. Imagine seeing all of humanity raised up at the same time. Imagine seeing all sickness go away at the same time. Imagine seeing not just human beings no longer suffering death and decay, but all of creation no longer suffering death and decay. Imagine that. And it's easy to say, oh yes, well, we'll live spiritually. We'll all go spiritually. You know, it'll be, it'll be great and we'll all just have this great, great and glorious dream and live in the spirit world. I think the spirit world might be a little more physical than we imagine. I mean, it's going to be creation itself. You know, the tree of life will never die. The, the, the son of man will never die. And mankind, humankind itself, one of these days will not die. That's, that's the faith that we have. The, the glory of God is in Jesus Christ who is raised up. And it's not going to die or age or get ill or anything else anymore. Who is now a high priest who can intercede with us because he suffered the same things that we have in, in every way. Meaning that in spite of the fact that we suffer what we suffer, we have that hope. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is the message that this is how much God loves us. God would actually give us evidence. God would actually give us a demonstration of what God has in store for us. God would seal us with the Holy Spirit. God would, would awaken us to that relationship that we have. God would literally free us from the fear of death even as we know we're going to it. Even as we see it coming. God has saved us from that fear of death. This is a fantastic thing. And I don't know if it would be as fantastic if it was, all, you know, when the, the apostles in the, the early church, they kept, they kept waiting in, for Jesus to come back and he never did. We talk about this being written down in AD 70. That's about when things started getting written down because the truth is that the apostles started dying off and people said, well, I guess Jesus might not come back today. I guess we better, and I might not live long enough to tell people what Peter said. Maybe I better write that down. Maybe we better write it down. Maybe these letters from Paul better be preserved and copied and distributed because, because you know, because the people who were there to see it might pass away, and then who will believe us? 
we've got to get this testimony. We've got to get this written down. We've got to get, get, the, get it documented. We've got to get the evidence done. And in the first hundred years of Christianity, bang, it's just done. Your, your, your all New Testament's written. The, the letters are written. The uh, gospel accounts are written. Everything else. And, they, and these things were written literally by eyewitnesses and by firsthand people who actually heard Peter speak and actually heard Paul speak. I mean, it's amazing. It's a wonderful thing that we have all of this. And now it's easy to say it's not true. It's easy for me to say there was no such person as George Washington. Abraham Lincoln is a myth. The Holocaust didn't happen. There was no Hitler. Martin Luther King is some, some cat that people made up. You see how far that goes? One of these days, see, I saw Martin Luther King. I saw him. I saw him. And I saw his picture on the news. One of these days, people are going to say, did this guy really exist? No, I think he was mythological. But we better write this down. We better shoot a picture. They didn't have pictures in that day. We better get this documented. And they did. And so we are all the benefactors of this. And, and I wish that, you know, I really feel blessed to have been focusing most of, most of my effort and, and to literally have, have a, as my job to be able to what am I supposed to do? Well if nothing else I look at the scripture and I think about it I look at this and I think about it and I say how do I get this across? And I look at it and I think about it and I say is it true? And I look at it and I think about it and I say mm, should I tell them this? Should I tell them that? But the point is I've looked at it and I've looked at it and I've looked at it and and I'm convinced this is Jesus Christ per se is the way and the truth and the life. And eternal life is available to everyone, even me, even you. And God, the creator of the universe, the one who has the right to judge and the right to punish, loved us. They, I love the, the, the verse that says, who, you know, who can condemn us? Who has the right to even judge us? Well, no one but Christ. And yet Christ came to save us. Christ came to intercede for us and die for us. So, I mean, the... the the hope with which, the confidence with which we should be living, the hope that we should have, not just in, oh, tomorrow's going to be okay, or we're going to get through this, or we're going to survive this, but in the, in the, in the glory of eternity, the, the hope that we should have, if, if we all had this hope, you know, if we all said, yes, well, that really was the Messiah, and and, and, and I'm going to trust and believe and follow what this Messiah says. And I'm going to go into all nations and make disciples and teach them what, what Christ has taught us. Oh, what a wonderful, what a, a, what a marvelous world this would be. B, what a marvelous life each of us personally would have. And, and I'll be honest with you, I'm getting more and more excited about this every day. I'm getting more confident about this every day. And, and I'm not, you know, when uh, my, my daughter tells her friend, says, yeah, my dad's a preacher. And they say, well, he must be really religious. And she says, no, not really. And I'm not really religious. But by golly, I'm certainly getting a little bit spiritual here. I'm starting to get excited about all this. And if I could only, I have to keep my head about it because, because if I go talking only lofty things and grand and grand schemes and everything, people say, eh, ah, you know, what are you talking about? So I gotta have to start with earth. I have to start with, yeah, I'm sinful too, but I'm I'm I have had fear too, but because you'd never believe me if I said, you know, I'm not even scared of dying. But I'm telling you, I'm not even scared of dying. Because I believe that Christ rose from the dead and and uh, and that uh, we that, that whoever believes in him will not die in the same sense that we're thinking about, but we'll have eternal life. And I am, I am not only am I looking forward to that eternal life, I feel like we're already living in it. And death is a hiccup somewhere along the way. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I, I, I just love you so much that I want you to hear this and get this. I want you to believe this and, and feel this. It's a joy. It's a joy. You're forgiven. And you're beloved, and you're a child of God.